Well, Richard, I think we have a critical mass. I think we do. I'm seeing a lot of boxes and welcome Deborah. I just saw Deborah Lamb uh, joining us. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started then. I wanna welcome everybody this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining the Landscape Architecture students for their final, for their, for their class presentation for this um, semester long capstone in uh, coastal resilience, focusing on Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Um, this has really been an exciting semester, not only because we have some extremely talented students who have all been putting in maximum effort to pull together some ideas of what Watch Hill looks like in 2050 um, with sea level rise, storm surge, and coastal erosion in mind. Um, but we also, with this capstone, have, have encouraged the students to work across disciplines. So the landscape architecture students are talking to the ocean engineering students, to the resource and environmental economics students, and our marine affairs student. Um, to really understand how other disciplines look at this challenge um, with a different lens or a different um, viewpoint. And we've been so fortunate this semester of having a, a stakeholder group that has really raised the bar in how stakeholders engage with our students. And so I really want to give a special shout out and thanks to Pete August, Janice Sassy, Deborah Lamb, Jocelyn from the Watch Hill Conservancy who, and others from the board, um, Joan Beth and Georgia, who have um, really contributed some significant time and effort and engagement um, across email, through video chats, throughout the semester. The students are no doubt gaining a boatload of skills that they can use in their next pursuit. So I just wanna really thank the stakeholder group for being so available and engaged. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Richard. This is the landscape architecture focused presentation, their final presentation for their class. And then next Wednesday, we will have the joint class presentation. I'll be sending out an agenda for that um, probably later today so that if you, can, if you can't make it for the full three hours, you can tune in for the part that you're most interested in. If, you can't, if you're making these you know, uh, individual class presentations, um, you may not need to sit in to get informed on the landscape architecture presentation on Wednesday, but we would love to have all of you join us for the full three hours next Wednesday at nine o'clock. Um, I did send out an email with the Zoom link for that as well. Um, so with that, I will be here. We have a chat. If you haven't used um, uh, Zoom before, um, if you hover your uh, mouse down toward the bottom of the screen, you can see the list of participants. There is a chat room. Um, I do have the class description uh, copied and pasted over in the chat. Um, and we, engage, we encourage you guys to um, uh, put your questions there. And Richard's going to walk us through how the next uh, couple hours is going to go with student presentations and getting feedback and questions from everyone. So with that, I will turn it over to Richard. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And I want to thank everybody for uh, joining in and helping uh, at this, uh, this particular semester. It's been a real adventure, I can assure you. And I'm sure that you're all going through the same adventure. Um, but anyways, what we're going to do this morning is um, uh, we're going to have uh, Carl Alamo do an initial kind of quick summary of um, what we did for our, uh, analysis and how we set up the project. And uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to have each individual student give a presentation of their own scenario of what they think uh, would be a helpful hint or uh, some guidance towards uh, getting ready for uh, sea level rise and, um, and <clears throat> the changing of the environment of um, Watch Hill. It'll be in groups of three or four. And what we'll do is we'll have like four presentations. They're gonna be about three to five minutes long each. And then we're gonna take a break and, uh, and have a short discussion. So if you wanna keep track of things or keep a scorecard and ask questions um, at those particular breaks, that would be great. Um, but the first group will be four, the second group will be three, the third group will be four students, and then the final one will be three. And, uh, and at the end, then we can have a, a longer discussion. Uh, but with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to uh, Carl, and I won't intrude on his presentation. Uh, and, uh, and Carl, you can take it away. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, all right, I think. Is that working for everyone? Okay. Um, well, my name is Carl. I'm calling all the way from Maine. Good morning, everyone. We are so fortunate to 
uh, to, to be here and to be safe. And we're so fortunate to have you be safe and to have you here. And we're so thrilled to be presenting our work for the 2020 Landscape Architecture Capstone Design Studio, where we explored coastal resilience um, in the village of Watch Hill in Westerly, Rhode Island. We are the seniors of Landscape Architecture and we are under the direction of Professor Richard Sheridan. And uh, we are also fortunate enough to have Seth uh, a part of our team. He is a graduate student in the Masters of Environment and Environmental Science and Management program was a background in civil engineering. Um, for our capstone, um, a little synopsis, I'll be going through an introduction and analysis and where we've gone. So far, we came up with a project statement of Watch Hill is undoubtedly one of New England's coastal gems historically developed to take optimal advantage of its superb peninsula shore location. Its natural and historic fabric are assets to be treasured and preserved. Working with stakeholders in Watch Hill in the Watch Hill Conservancy, students are challenged to address three feet of sea level rise, storm surge, historic character, and commercial development in a multidisciplinary fashion, understanding unique design problems that are broad in scale and complex in nature. And if there's one thing that we learned in our entire time in the landscape architecture design studio, it's investing in good design is, is good business. And going into good design, Land Design, which is a multidisciplinary design firm uh, all around the country, recognizes this as co uh, creative collaboration, feeling like a true contributor, and also designing to make an impact. And all of these together are tools that we have used in creating good designs for the Watch Hill area. Uh, a quote that Professor Sheridan gave us in the beginning is that, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir people's blood. This is from Daniel Burnham, uh, a famous American architect and a tone setter for our capstone and how we went about go going into the capstone. So for an introduction, why Watch Hill? Well, fashion design magazine Vogue wrote an article last summer about the town and we chose Watch Hill because of its historic character, its integration of people, its integration of recreation, its iconic historic value, and also its iconic coastal views. Watch Hill, again, is undoubtedly one of New England's coastal gems, and this picture of Bay Street um, relates it not only to New England, but also to Rhode Island specifically. It's the perfect capstone topic to be doing at the University of Rhode Island. In our analysis, again, we were challenged to look at three feet of sea level rise, but it's our duty as landscape architects to look beyond that, plan for the future, um, and see what we can do in terms of uh, innovative design to address resilience uh, past the three feet mark. During our analysis um, process, we were fortunate to have a registered landscape architect provide us with not only a local, not just a local perspective, but also a professional perspective in terms of class collaboration. He was Nathan Sosha, and he's from a multidisciplinary firm called Beta. We split up our analysis groups into, uh, we split up into four groups, commercial and residential, historic and cultural, green spaces and infrastructure. For historic character, we identified four main points the flying horse carousel, the oldest carousel in the United States, the iconic ocean house that sits up on top of Watch Hill, the chief Ninigrit statue that commemorates the Native Americans, the French and Indian War, and how Watch Hill got its name, and also the Hurricane of 1938 Memorial uh, that set the kind of tone for the, uh, the capstone in terms of coastal resilience for the area. We identified that 21.6% of the Watch Hill area is green space, and this includes Napa Tree Point and the lawn along uh, Commercial Bay Street. In looking at sea level rise and storm surge from storm tools, we identified areas of uh, highest risk, including the parking lots and how they are going to be impacted with uh, also pedestrian nodes, the existing infrastructure that is used to mitigate sea level rise and storm surge, uh, including the seawall and also the existing roads and underground infrastructure. Going into the conceptualization, 
we looked at a precedent called Climate Ready Boston. Um, this was before the coronavirus and we started all together by thinking about the natural and historic fabric uh, of the Watchill area and how these are assets to be treasured and preserved. Um, one thing that we all did together before the coronavirus was we did conceptual drawing. We broke off into teams to really get a sense of um, what might work in the area in terms of resilience. Um, and Madison, I don't know where my mouse is, but Madison Holland closes it with this quote, recognizing storm surge and sea level rise as two sides of the same coin. Um, I wanted to acknowledge also that being all impacted so differently now with uh, the pandemic, we have all had different resources, but we are thrilled to present you with what we have and what we've come up with and all that we've done for the past semester. And with that, we'll go into the design phase. Hi, I'm Megan. I'll be uh, presenting first. Just let me know if you guys can see this. Can you, can you all see this? Yes. Okay, cool. So hi again, um, my name is Megan Donahoe and I'm a senior in the landscape architecture program. And I'll be showing everyone my ideas and design for the village of Watch Hill. And the concept of my design primarily focuses on sea level rise tactics, connectivity and access on site. So here's my final board I put together for this project. And to break things down, I'll be starting with my master plan I created. I wanted to create a second line of defense for the shops of Bay Street behind the already raised seawall. I took into consideration about the existing site that only has about 21.6% public green space. So I want to create more. My idea to incorporate new green space into the area encouraged the removal of existing parking lots. These existing parking lots would then contain new green space where I would want to implement the idea of ecological dunes. This dune or mound design will mimic the way sand dunes are modeled on beaches. So, let's rose. Oops, sorry about that. Um, this is the area I chose for the dune design because I based, um, based on our research and analysis, this is where most of the water intrusion is projected to be by the year 2050. So I created a cross section of what the dune design would look like. These dunes would allow for, um, would follow the design of mounds ranging anywhere from two to four feet. This design will have both a constructed edge where the people go and um, another side that is an ecological corridor containing coastal plants and grasses that will encourage natural growth. The constructed edge will be a hardscape incorporated into the topography as stairs. These stairs would provide a place for people to sit and relax and look out into the water. It will also provide access for people to enjoy the new green space. Like I said before, this new structure is designed to act as a second line of defense between the shops and the raised seawall. The ranging topography along with the stairs allow to catch access water from any storm or any sea level rise as shown in the second cross section. So touching upon transportation, um, oops, sorry. Um, touching, upon, touching upon transportation, since the new green space design will take up most of the existing parking lots, I looked at alternative parking areas. Taking away around 200 parking spots will free up the downtown area to be predominantly for pedestrians and encourage sustainable transportation, such as biking and the use of buses. This will also allow visitors to focus more on their visit to Watch Hill rather than be constantly watching for vehicular traffic as they travel throughout the site, especially in the busy summer months. With the use of a shuttle system, there would be a satellite parking areas located at the Musquamacate Golf Club, the Westerly State Airport, and the Westerly Marina. These shuttles would run around every 10 to 20 minutes, picking up to 30 people at once and transporting them to the bus stop located right on Bay Street. There would be an increase from the original 200 existing parking spots downtown to around 500 um, satellite parking spots. 
So here are some pictures of what these parking lots look like today. And I took these while um, during our first site visit. And here's a final perspective of what I plan to transform them into. Um, functional ecological dunes to serve as a second line of defense against sea level rise, as well as an area for people to use and enjoy while experiencing the downtown area of Watch Hill. Thank you. Okay, Aid. Can you see that? Yes. Let's see. Let's make it full screen here. All right. Um, so, hi, my name is Aiden Walsh. Um, this is my capstone project for Watch Hill. Uh, Watch Hill is currently facing the effects of a rising sea level uh, and storm uh, inundation. Uh, as we saw in, in Carl's introduction, our main problem areas are at the parking lots on either end of Bay Street and along Bay Street itself as well. Um, with these issues, we're faced with the following questions of how can we mitigate the effects of a rising sea level while maintaining these existing characters of the town? Can we create uh, habitats that can be beneficial to native species and provide a space for tourists and residents, uh, space for passive uses? And how can we improve the circulation throughout the site without causing major changes to the existing structure of the town? Uh, so for my concept, um, basically we want to uh, have a reinforced seawall to better protect downtown Watch Hill um, from encroaching tides, uh, to improve the green space, to, imp to advance stormwater mitigation, provide habitat and allow passive recreation improve parking to reduce the amount of paved surfaces and make parking lots safer and reconfigured uh, circulation patterns to reduce the speed of traffic downtown and to promote a walkable New England village. This is my master plan. Um, as you can see, there's a new parking plan, um, a deployable seawall along on the south side of the Fort Road parking lots reinforced uh, seawall to the existing wall that's there. Um, the new green space along Bay Street, I'm calling Bay Street Park. Uh, there's a uh, fire, changes to the parking lot and fire, the uh, fire district parking lot to make that a garage and one way traffic on Bay Street with a bike lane. I'll get a little bit more into it here. Um, for, so for the seawall, the, um, the image on the top shows the how the deployable seawall would go. Uh, it's be ready to be installed at a moment's notice in the event of a storm or nuisance tide to protect the, the Fort Road parking lots from flooding. And below, uh, you can see the existing seawall would be built up to three feet tall from the existing height, which is insufficient to prevent uh, future flooding um, based on the the uh, information that we've acquired throughout the semester. Um, for Bay Street Park, there's artificial dunes throughout the, the site. Um, these would serve as passive green spaces that would provide habitat and protein for native and migrating species while filtering toxins from rainwater uh, before returning to the ocean. Uh, Bay Street Park features undulating walkways for passive use uh, with several op observation points, including accessible granite blocks protruding into Watch Hill Cove, uh, shaded lookout over the cove, and um, a relocated gazebo um, to provide a point of to rest and observe native and migratory wildlife. Moving on to parking, um, I've reconfigured the parking lots. Um, the Fort Road lots will be reconstructed using permeable asphalt to serve uh, the new plan. As they exist today, they act as one large parking lot that can get rather chaotic on busy days. The new plan will break the space up into two smaller lots, providing adequate space for parking spots and travel lanes. Um, and the existing building that's there will be realigned to allow for addi additional parking spaces. Um, 
the slots that are they'll there's plenty of spots that will be lost due to the construction of the Bay Street Park. Um, those will be relocated to the fire district parking lot, which will be turned into a two-story parking garage, effectively doubling that lot's capacity. And then to the right, um, the Watch Hill Conservancy parking lot will be paved with permeable asphalt as well and repainted to allow adequate space for parking slots and travel lanes. Similar to the other two, the other parking lot on Fort Road, it can get pretty chaotic. Um, and it seems as people just park where they please, this will allow a little bit more structure and, and uh, make those parking lots safer. Um, with these three parking lots combined is a total of 471 parking spots. Uh, and that's not including parking space along the side of the road. Um, and then finally moving into circulation, um, Bay Street and Larkin Road will be reduced to one-way traffic to increase pedestrian safety and allow for a new bike lane to go through town. And then a roundabout will be installed at the corner of Larkin Road and Bluff Ave so that the people who live on Bluff Ave won't be forced to drive uh, through town to uh, access their, their homes. Um, and, you, and you can see that there's parking spaces on, on either side of the road and a room for a bike lane in the middle. Um, and that's, uh, that's my, that concludes my presentation. Let me stop sharing here. Yeah, so. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, no? Yep, we can see oh, okay. it. Wait, but can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Ooh. You're reloading. Okay. okay. Hi, my name is Inthasone. So this is my design for a watch hill. Um, some precedents I took inspiration from was Climate Ready Boston. Which, is, uh, which was done in South Boston that Carl already mentioned. They already have elements that are being implemented and they have things that we're using for our design now, which is improved infrastructure, a vertical seawall, a harbor walk, and a living shoreline with improved dunes. Another precedent was from, I took was from Detroit, Michigan. Um, it's the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy which has a series of connections in, by the Detroit Riverfront that has circular hills, beach inlets, uh, pedestrian paths that have views into the water. And all this was meant to create generational bonds to the area. Um, so these are just some photos that I took on our site visit and also from Google images that show the type of material that is being used that doesn't help the issue of sea level rise that we're facing. Um, so the goals of my design are to create water experiences that provide opportunities for users to interact with it. Uh, the second one is to conserve access, pedestrian access to Napa Tree Point, uh, but this time kind of make it safer and more clear. And then the final goal is to increase um, and build up vegetative buffers throughout the site. So this is my plan that focuses on Watch Hill Cove. Um, I propose a boardwalk, um, new pedestrian paths, um, built up dunes and vegetation throughout the site and a reorientation of the parking lots and buildings. So to focus on the boardwalk, um, it's located along the existing seawall, which I propose to also be built up and expanded um, and improved. So it, my boardwalk starts by Ms. Quamacut, Ms. Quamacut um, Club, all the way up to the north of going by Chief Nittigret statue. Um, there are three points out that will extend into the water to give the user the, the feeling of being in the water. Um, it also has seating on either side that 
provides views into the, the cove that a lot of people go to the site just to experience. This will also have, um, be a safe and clear way to get to Napa Tree Point as well. And then focusing on pedestrian connection and access by the south um, where the old carousel was, I proposed to reorient the building so it's facing the cove. Um, there's also um, more access to the yacht club as well as the boardwalk. And with a reorientation of the buildings, this provided more space to include a vegetative area. So again, like how I said, um, the carousel be, will be relocated because it's an area that will be most affected, um, and one of the areas that will be most affected by sea level rise. Another part that includes a pedestrian connection are these paths that will provide access to the dock as well as the, um, the boardwalk and direct access to um, Bay Street. Oh, and by Chief Ninagir's statue. And then finally, I have, I propose a dock area. Um, this is to encourage water taxis and boats and kayaks to gather there to highlight the opportunities that we have to um, bring water interactions. So by the dock, there are stairs that go straight into the water that allows the user to have um, direct contact to the water and the cove. Um, and so with that, thank you. Hello. <laughs> All right, I'll be, the, <laughs> I'll be the last in our presenting group. Uh, my name is Carl again. I'll share my screen. Uh, um, I don't know what I'm... Okay. Can everyone hear me and see this? All right. My name is Carl and my concept um, was looking into redefining resilience and taking Daniel Burnham's magic quote for stirring people's blood um, and really taking it forward through this capstone process. I have two main concepts uh, and new concepts, allotexture and submergence. My actual design interventions within the watch trail area include green infrastructure, jetty formations and submerged meadows for short-term uh, mitigation and then also pedestrianization with permeable paving, lo uh, lagoon transposition and sediment manipulation for long-term. The first concept I looked into was allotexture and this was uh, a new concept that I coined that merges biomimicry with landscape architecture to directly target a specific type of design for um, sea level rise and storm surge mitigation Oh, sorry. I came up with this uh, from our mid-semester review where the civil engineering, ocean engineering, and environmental and natural resource economic students all said one of the most, uh, Watch Hill is one of the most important places um, and rest areas globally for bird migration. Looking into this, I started to consider the, uh, the, the geometry of wings and the anatomy of birds and their ability to manipulate, manipulate harsh sea winds um, and I wanted to transpose that into the landscape for the ability to uh, mitigate and manipulate harsh sea currents. Allotexture is derived from the Latin root for wing and texture is a derivative of landscape architecture. And I used allotexture to answer a probing question of how can downtown Watch be effectively reimagined to promote experiences and economy while supporting its ecology, infrastructure and historic character. Uh, looking into Watch Hill and its existing conditions after implementing allotexture, uh, you can see the pedestrianization, the relocated parking and reimagined infrastructure. It starts with uh, a greenway and transforming the utilized um, strips of lawn and turning them into areas of green infrastructure, uh, relocating the parking to the areas of lowest risk that the engineering students identified behind the Bay Street buildings, turning that parking lot into permeable paving 
and turning the existing parking lot into a green space supplemented by a pedestrian way to the cabanas while maintaining emergency access. Specifically on that title role of Allotexture, I had this um, implementation of wing-shaped jetties that allow for public access and boat access to the Watch Hill area. It allows fishing um, areas within the insides of the wings um, and also adds a new dimension to the sea wall for surge protection. Looking into my second concept of submergence, I wanted to use this concept to think about sea level rise and storm surge in a different light and seeing them as and accepting them as unyielding natural processes and allowing the Watch Hill area uh, to regenerate. And I use submergence to answer the probing question, how can unyielding natural processes of sea level rise and storm surge support tourism and historic character through resilient regenerative systems? I started looking into the context of the Little Narragansett Bay area and the system of the cove and how the cove works in terms of boat circulation, the barrier islands, um, and all the inner workings of this the Little Narragansett Bay system. I identified three uh, issues with this, um, the eroding barrier island, which provides um, a great form of protection for the area, the dredging uh, issue that was identified by the Watch Hill stakeholders, along with the diminishing habitat along the barrier island and Napa Tree Point. I use submergence um, to look at diffusing storm surge before it reaches the cove, rather than um, putting up a gate at the cove in the instance of direct impact, and by implementing dune grasses, I mean, oh my gosh, eel grasses, uh, it would allow for increasing biodiversity, um, diffusing the surge, and also um, supporting the migration that's so important to the Watch Hill area. Uh, again, here are uh, the graphics for that with the variety of eel grasses that would be implemented for new submerged metal habitats along with their diffusion. And it also follows that direction of allotexture and in terms of this, a similar process with how far there's diffused air for the ability of flight. Again, looking at the, the cove and the Watch Hill Fire dis District, I um, took into consideration the congested salt ponds. The natural resource economics students identified these salt ponds um, uh, by saying the salt ponds offer the lowest risk um, and most economically feasible potential for mitigation. So in looking at these salt ponds, I uh, and proposed a design intervention of including inlets and outlets and channels to allow for um, alleviating the congestion of the pinched salt ponds, um, which would induce soil softening, beach recovery, uh, surge mitigation, and sediment transit, all for reducing the risk of flooding through increasing high water capacity, allowing sediment transit to rebuild the beaches uh, over a long term period of time, and then also all at the same time providing habitat uh, re rehabilitated for the important species of the Watch Hill area. And that is my presentation. Was that um, the first group of four, Carl? Okay. Yes. Um, why don't we, I think we're gonna take a pause there. I think Richard's uh, taking a break for a second um, or he's uh, off uh, offline. So- Did I do it? Okay, here I am. Oh, here you are, <laughs> hi. Yeah, I, I forget to do this, these kinds of things. Um, yeah, that's the first four and um, we open it up for discussion and that would be great. Anybody's got any questions or uh, inputs or comments? We would love to hear them at this time. So I have a question. I'll start off, um, and I, I just thank you all four of you. Um, very thoughtful um, presentations and design strategies for the area. Um, I have little stars and questions for each of you, but I, I think what I just want to do is I'll ask one question and pass it on to others. Um, so Carl, just because you're just fresh in my mind, um, you talked about diffusing surge and you talked about eel grasses. Um, 
did you talk to the ocean engineering students about wave attenuation and, and what kinds of strategies from an engineering perspective could be you know, deployed in that area um, in, in, in concert with the design strategy you put forward? Uh, I actually didn't get a chance to. I meant to, but there's so much going on personally in of my course. life with the coronavirus, but okay. yeah. Yeah, so I think that that's one thing I would just suggest if you were to, you know, to take me this on to the next level or to, if you're going to package this in your portfolio, to uh, maybe have some talking points on what um, we talked about. I love, first of all, your concept was so strong and you had so many layers to it. And the idea of, you know, that like wing diffuses air, you want to diffuse storm surge through these techniques. But I just think you need to maybe think about sort of taking that to the next level of just having a few talking points. It doesn't have to be in great depth, but what would be your strategy in, in, in um, engaging with engineers to really think about wave attenuation for that part of your design story? You had so mm. many layers in this, but I think that's really an important one with regard to coastal resilience. So I just yeah. wanted to put that out there. Um, I'll just say a couple other things about the other students while I have the floor. Um, in the zone, I love that you brought forward Climate Ready Boston and Detroit as examples that the Watch Hill Conservancy can draw from. I think it's important for us to you know, look at other places that we can draw inspiration from. So I wanna thank you for, for doing that. Um, and Aiden, uh, I think you considering circulation outside of the um, immediate Watch Hill area was very thoughtful and the integration of the bike lane, you thought about parking in a comprehensive way. Um, that was also very sort of program, um, program uh, friendly and thinking about sort of the actual uses uh, in the Watch Hill area. Um, so thank you for doing that. And then um, a question for Megan, so I'll, I'll wrap up with another engineering question. Um, the question for Megan is, you designed this dune system uh, along Bay Street. I'm wondering if you consider the ends of the dune and where, if the water, um, if the dune will be sufficient in really keeping seawater out from sea level rise at the ends of the dune. Because when we look at um, flood control barriers, you know, if, for example, the Fox Point hurricane barrier in Providence, there are these wing walls that can come out of, you know, uh, bridges and built walls to really keep the water from seeping in at the edges. So I'm just wondering if you thought about sort of the pattern of how the water wants to get into the Watch Hill area through your dune design. Um, I did not think of the edges at all, which I probably should have, but like that wing idea you s mentioned would have probably um, worked with what I was thinking of. Okay, so think about that again as you're putting this into your portfolio mm -hmm. and moving forward. Um, you know, how would you sort of just a couple of bullet points of how you would engage with engineers to um, address that, you know, sort of concern to make sure that you're communicating this comprehensive strategy. Okay. So with that, I will, I will close and pass it on to the next uh, commenter. Thank you guys. Thank you. I can start calling them. Oh, there's Pete. Okay. <laughs> Just to quickly chime in, I, uh, I am incredibly impressed with your creativity and out of the box thinking, but what really is so effective for me to understand where you're going with this or your really, your beautiful renderings. It brings your ideas to life, and um, uh, I, I, I found your artwork and your uh, graphic design just an essential part of your, your thinking and designing on this, so hats off to you. Thank you. I, I have questions. Hi, everybody. This is Chris Baxter from Ocean Engineering. Uh, and my, I also want to echo what, what uh, Pete just said. I was really impressed with the quality of the presentations. And I have questions that are more meant as uh, not necessarily criticisms, but uh, constructive. They're meant to be constructive, and so I hope you guys all take them in that light. Uh, my first question is for the first two presenters, Megan, and I, and I didn't jot down the, the first name. I apologize. Aiden. But you got, Aiden. You, Aiden, sorry. You guys essentially have um, a levee, or a re you call it a dune, in front of Bay Street. And I guess my question is, did you consider the view shed of the, of the storm, of the stores along, along Bay Street and what they would be looking at uh, as, you know, out, outside their front door? Uh, yeah, I, um, 
I don't know if it was kind of hard to see or not in the uh, in the presentation mode, but there's contour lines and and I, I did consider that. I tried to keep the dunes at a, a, a relatively low height so that they wouldn't uh, impact that view too hard. Um, but obviously, with that, there's going to be some loss of view. But I tried to keep it at a minimum. And same with me, basically what he just said. Mine are at a bunch of different like heights, so. Okay. Um, I think uh, for the third presentation in zone, uh, you have a seawall. And I think a lot of you guys have seawalls. Certainly the first three presentations uh, used seawalls at different places. And I was particularly interested, I think it's on Ford Street, down on the southern end. Uh, I'm interested as, as whether you considered more nature-based solutions down in that area. It seems like if you're worried about the ocean encroaching from the south, uh, not in the bay, not in the, in the cove, but from the south, it seems like that would be a really nice place for like reinforced dunes or something, something there to protect the southern end of the, of the study area. And I was wondering if you thought of that at all or considered anything beside just a seawall. Um, I kind of just focus on the sea wall, but I did consider that I added some dunes around the Misquamacut Club, the house area. Um, yep. I wanted to like raise or like put, put some dunes there, but I felt, I don't know like if that would help that much. So I kind of just left it alone and I focused around the area um, with the cove. Okay. So, sorry, Thanks. that didn't help. <laughs> okay. And my final question is for Carl. Um, I, I, you know, I enjoyed your concept. Uh, you clearly had a vision and, and we're working with it. It seemed to me that your, um, your focus uh, of your vision was almost entirely or, or on, on the uh, natural environment. And, uh, and I'm wondering how does the built environment fit into your vision? And specifically, you're talking about inlets along those coastal ponds. I think there are a lot of homeowners uh, in the in those coastal ponds that would uh, be concerned with that, um, and uh, so I, I wanted to strike. Um, I wanted to get your comments on how does the built environment fit into your vision uh, of uh, of of your focus on on nature. Uh, so for the built environment, I was looking for that to be more of um more short term mitigation rather than long term like with the natural um, processes for the built environment what i included for that was the the relocation of parking behind bay street where it was identified there was the lowest risk uh behind the or the retail strip and then also including green infrastructure along the um including um the the geodesic dunes that Aiden and Megan mentioned along with um, rain gardens for a, a line of internal defense um, for the perimeter of the Watch Hill Cove. Um, and then also the, the wing-shaped jetties for providing um, a new dimension to the seawall that's currently there while also providing access um, uh, both by land and by sea. I liked the wing-shaped jetties for access. Um, I would say, you know, those could possibly have, uh, you might design something like that to, to try to attenuate waves, but waves aren't an issue in the cove. Um, mm. it, it's more of a sea, it's more like sea level rise and, or surge, and they wouldn't do much for that. So anyway, I, those are my comments. Thank you guys. Okay, if there aren't any more comments or um, <coughs> questions, uh, let's, let's go on to the, uh, oh, Janet, you've got one. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, I was very impressed with these. I thought they were great. And um, I really liked the satellite parking and, and commuting. I thought that's a really good concept that you should uh, pursue. And I was very impressed with Carl's presentation, but because you know you went into such detail, I do have some questions. <laughs> um, and uh, one of them was about the um, salt ponds doing the um, <clears throat> putting inlets in them. I wasn't sure were you doing those to um, create more flood storage? What, what was the purpose of those? 
And just a quick note, Janet Friedman is uh, the coastal geologist for our Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council. It's our coastal uh, regulatory agency, just in case anyone out there doesn't know Janet. Yeah. Go ahead, Carl. Sorry, I didn't <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, tr I'll try to be, uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, in terms of inlets and outlets, I wanted to, with the salt ponds being um, congested and not really having much hydrologic cir circulation, I wanted to um, promote more soil softening rather than soil hardening to um, increase uh, high water capacity to kind of decrease the threat of um, flooding uh, through like sediment transit and then allowing sediment transit too to rebuild the beaches on the southern end of the, the fire district for a kind of long-term natural regenerative defensive strategy. Yeah, so some, I, I think that that's, it, that really, sh you're going to have to rethink that. Mm. But one, you know, the sediment transit's going to all go into the ponds and fill up the uh, ponds quite a bit with um, putting in new inlets. Um, and we've seen that with the bigger ponds when we have put them in. Okay. Um, but also you're you're looking at a endless reservoir so they're not going to be doing with the storm surge they're mm. not really going to be um you know a, a good mitigation for for flood waters other than storm water perhaps but um certainly not ocean waters um so i think maybe you should rethink that a little bit and okay. then also, um, did you look at the existing eelgrass beds already in Little Narragansett Bay? I believe there's really, uh, there a lot over by the, um, by the barrier, by Sandy Point barrier in that area. Okay. Um, I, I looked in it, well, I looked into it slightly um, through the Sea Grant website, I think, um, before mm -hmm. we all left for spring break and didn't come back. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, that was pretty much the depth I got into it. Okay. Yeah, there are some some maps on what eelgrass is there, and eelgrass is really tricky to grow. Mm. It will take off if you create the correct environment, but if it's not the good habitat, it's really really difficult. Just to keep in mind. Okay. But anyway, I loved your uh, concepts and. Uh, that was great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, with that, let's uh, go on to the next group. Uh, and Spencer, you're the first one up. Spencer, are you uh, muted? Are you muted. <laughs> Let's see. I just unmuted you, Spencer. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I had I had it muted on my computer before, and then I have it muted twice. I guess. Um, Go back a slide, then start over. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> all right. So, hi everyone. My name is uh, Spencer Beebe, and I wanted to thank you all for uh, joining us today and for your support and involvement throughout the semester. I'd first like to share what I was searching for within this project, and that's really how to accommodate sea level rise and high nuisance tides while preserving pedestrian access to the historical Watchill Village. And for myself, I really believe that in design, um, good design can create impactful experiences for the community, and in this case, for Watchill. So in order to really understand the site, I really first enveloped myself into storm tools provided by Teresa focusing on sea level rise, building risk assessment, as well as historical storms. And with this knowledge and this data, conceptual ideas and alternative sites began to form. So after study of the site and in-depth research into uh, ideas and plans and conceptual plans, the master plan began to form. So the proposed design for Watch Hill focuses heavily on accommodation of stormwater and sea level rise. Additionally, it allows for full pedestrian and site access education through green infrastructure as well. So contained in the design are bioswales, which through the race topography on the site will also allow for the capture of stormwater runoff 
as well as the inundation of high daily nuisance tides into the Watchill area, reducing a lot of that uh, saltwater intrusion into the infrastructure. As well, there will be open green spaces that will act as passive gathering areas of rest while increasing the greenery within the Watcho Village to 80,000 square feet. There will also be stone barriers, although not necessarily a daily issue as of right now, it may be in the future, and storm surge can um, cause a greater effect inland to Watch Hill. But with the implementation of these naturally and locally quarried stone um, slabs within each bioswale, as well um, as in the entrances, uh, they will provide a storm surge barrier into um, Watch Hill. So the pedestrian connectivity on the site will allow for a complete site exploration and connection to the cove and the beach, the cabanas, shops, the carousel, as well as uh, Napa Tree Point. Now the parking on the site will be reduced, um, but this is intentional. There are plenty of spaces for shopping and existing cabana and the beach club. But over time, the design focuses on phasing out more vehicles on site and in the implementation of more public transportation from offsite locations. And finally is the sand dunes. And confronting sand dunes and wave attenuation with was a difficult problem to take on and, and research into seaweed became very promising for me. And seaweed along Narragansett Bay, um, I was, had seen can, pro can produce problems, including beach closures, habitat loss, aesthetic issues, as well as climate issues. And in a study done by Texas A&M, excess seaweed was utilized to stabilize sand dunes on beaches. And by compacting these particular seaweeds into modular blocks, they're able to be buried beneath newly formed sand dunes in order to stabilize these dunes, work as a fertilizer for the vegetation, as well as reduce the amount of nitrogen being released into the water. So this idea will be implemented in the area directly adjacent to the beach cabanas in order to reduce the wave action coming into the Watch Hill Cove. So with this research, uh, these dunes will hold up aggressively to wave action as well as promote sustainable growth within the area. In the first section, you can see the ocean front moving into the beach cabanas and then the final, and then finally into the cove. As it is shown, the bioswales begin to form and are integrated into the race topography and which begin to retain the future and inevitable sea level rise. So this next section represents the entrance into the cove parking lot. And along Bay Street, there will be, plant, there will be implemented one-way traffic as well as open green spaces bioswales, storm surge protection, that will also function as seating into the boardwalk as well as a boardwalk that connects the entire site. The final section represents the area where the watch shops begin to the north. As just previously mentioned, this area will have one-way traffic with 45 degree parking along the shop side, green space, bioswales, and a boardwalk. In this particular section, the boardwalk will bump out into the cove where it'll provide a view into the width of the enhanced seawall, the marshland below, and a beautiful outlook into the cove itself. So through this design, site connectivity is achieved with inter interlaced pedestrian pathways throughout the site. The area accommodates tides and rising sea level by the implemented bioswales throughout the cove. It defends against storm surge and wave action through stone barriers and sand dunes enhanced with sea bells. And finally, it educates the public about how the design functions and how green infrastructure is used in order to combat climate change and rising sea levels. Thank you. Just a, just a quick note before we move on to the next one, I just wanna give Spencer a special shout out because Spencer served as the class liaison um, with the other disciplines this semester. So thank you for providing that service, Spencer. I wanted to just um, of course, yeah. I'll give you a special thank shout you. out for that before we move on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Joe, are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Well, before I start, just uh, I apologize for any background noise because People are currently on my roof cleaning shingles on, um, but <laughs> they picked a great time for it. But um, so hi everyone, my name is Joe, and I am a senior in the landscape architecture capstone class, directed by Professor Richard Sheridan. 
And my goal when designing this site was to provide the stakeholders and owners of Watch Hill with uh, providing solutions to three plus feet of sea level rise and storm surge through uh, protecting and accommodating. This is our focus area, the Watch Hill Cove. And here are the current conditions of the site. So my design focuses on a few main concepts. And I'm going to begin with the bioswales. So this design adds about 12,900 square feet of bioswales along the road and around the parking lot at the north end of the site. This is represented by the green areas on site that are, are highlighted. And in the event that water reaches these points during a storm, the bioswales will capture water and properly drain it before it is able to inundate the, the road and the, sto the stores that are close by. Next, we have green space. So additional green space was added to the site, totaling around 270,000 plus square feet of green space, which is highlighted on the screen. And overall parking was reduced to about 275 spots, uh, which are spread out through three parking lots on the site. Um, the highlighted green space is comprised of uh, a series of berms that raise up three feet in most areas. And in some areas, it raises up five feet from the boardwalk along the seawall um, up to the streets and up to the cabanas. So next we have circulation and throughout the um, elevating berms is a series of walkways um, that one improves pedestrian circulation and accessibility to the site. Um, two allows pedestrians to gain a full experience of the ecological spotlight and the uh, coastal gem that Watch Hill is. And three, it acts as a constant lookout point to the rest of the site and into the cove for pedestrians as they travel through the site. And this brings back some historical significance of what the site used to stand, stand as, which was a lookout point during the French and Indian War. So this first section indicated on the map highlighted, uh, highlights the bioswales, the walkways, the elevating berms, and the raised seawall. So here's the, the first section. And highlighted now are the bioswales along the road, which contain various species of salt tolerant plants, shrubs, and grasses. Highlighted here is the pedestrian activity throughout the site. You can see the, the walkway through the elevated berms in the middle of the section. And highlighted here is uh, <clears throat> the elevated, the elevating berms and the, um, the raised seawall. So again, the the berms are containing various types of species. Um, and at this section on the wall, um, I actually implemented a timeline along the wall, which highlights significant events that essentially developed Watch Hill into what it is today. So here's the second section that was taken, which is um, over by the cabanas. And so highlighted here is the elevating berm which uh, that is running along the site. Uh, here again is the, the pedestrian circulation and activity along the site. Again, you can, you can see the uh, um, pathway, the walkways going through the, the, the berms um, for pedestrians. And intentionally I made them so they were at uh, the high point uh, of the berm. So they'll be able to, to gain that full view of the site. Um, and then here's just a little perspective um, of what the timeline I, I kind of envisioned it as um, so with dates and um, the outlines of, of what the significant event is. Um, and then obviously like descriptions of what's going on um, along the site. And so tying back to my uh, initial goal protection was provided by the seawall and the vegetated berms and accommodation was provided by the bioswales um, and the uh, and the walkways for like the circulation thank you very good <clears throat> Kevin are you there Yes, I'm here. 
Okay. Give me one second. Okay. I need to figure this out because it's really confusing. Um, so you said it's share screen. Uh, we'll have a break after Kevin's presentation and uh, be able to discuss these three. Nice job, Joe, presenting with the, the hammering going on in the background. That was, that was good. <laughs> Thank you. I hope it wasn't too much of a distraction. Nope, we're all getting through these little challenges. Okay. Terminator coming to my house in a few yeah. hours. So we're all dealing with it. <laughs> nice wake up call at, at nine o'clock in the morning. We all have to have a sense of humor on some level about it. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Nice work. It says I need to grant it um, access, but I have, but it's not letting me. Hold on. It says private. So, okay, so Kevin, I'm going to, let's see, can I, uh, so on the bottom where it says share screen, yeah. it's not letting you share screen? It says to choose between desktop one, and then I am, and it says open system preferences. And then I'm opening system preferences, but it's not, I don't know if I'm supposed to click something. So you should have, it says select window and application that you want to share and then you click yeah. on that screen. Okay. So that's just not coming up. No, it is. But then it says I have to open system preferences on my MacBook. Okay. I don't know how Carl did it. Uh... Yeah, mine was just share screen and then I clicked on the window and then it all worked out. Okay. See, it says open system preferences, security, privacy to grant access. And then I'm doing that. And then I'm choosing Google Chrome, but then it's not letting me. What, pre oh, wait a minute. So that may be, uh, I don't know. Are you showing on a PowerPoint or are you? I'm showing a Google, uh, a slide presentation on Google. A Google slide, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I've chosen, I've chosen Google Chrome and then I've yeah. exited it and then I go back to share screen and then it doesn't, hold on. Let me see if this will let me do this because I think I closed. Yeah, I closed my thing. Give me one second. Okay. It's probably, so I apologize for this. Oh, that's all right. We're here for you. <laughs> uh, I don't know why it keeps saying to show. Okay, mm. so I, I was able to find the screen, but it keeps on opening. Um, yeah. um. Kevin, try and do it on Safari, not Google Chrome. See if that helps. Okay. Going. Safari. Yeah, that's a good point, Pete. Um, actually, is your Google Doc or Google Slide Deck um, available to send to me and then I can just share it and you can tell me when to advance the slide, Kevin. Sounds great. Yes, I can do that. Okay. Just email it over to me. Thank you, Pete. What a great suggestion. Thank you. And I apologize for this. I've not yet had enough coffee <laughs> to problem solve that one. All right. You have my email? Uh, no, give me one second. Yeah. Let me find this and then Richard, do you want to do questions for the other two while we're doing this? Uh, that would be fine. Uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, I'd just like to say that um, <clears throat> for Spencer, the wave attenuation that you talked about, I'm glad that you took the information that Isabella sent over to us uh, via email. Uh, and she sent it twice. I know I uh, emailed it 
to you, and I know there was a lot of yeah. information that was mm -hmm. going back and forth, but uh, I'm glad that you really took uh, took that information to heart and made it a focus or a, a connecting point um, with the uh, the engineering people. But I'm just going to open it up to anybody that would like to talk about uh, Joe's or Spencer's uh, presentation. Hi, um, this is Janet. Um, can I uh, ask a question yes. or, or make a comment? Yeah, yes, on, um, on Joe's, I noticed that um, I really like that you use a low gradient seaward slope on the, um, you know, the elevated berm. That's really important that we found um, on our, um, you know, green infrastructure sites that decreasing that gradient um, allows any wave energy to run up rather than scoop out and erode the um, the burn. So good good for you on doing that. Thank you. Um, but I'm also wondering, did anyone ever look at um, beach um, erosion on these projects or what's going to happen on the beach side? I think we, we uh, we did um, look into that a little bit. And one of the things that I've, if I remember correctly in the beginning of the semester that I found was that um, with the rise of, like the rising sea level, um, like the, the point um, was going to get like pretty inundated with water. And then like that whole side was kind of going to get um, taken away if I remember correctly. Yeah, I, yeah, well, there'll be changes. <laughs> anyway, it, it's, uh, you know, something else to think about while you're doing these is a great presentations, um, but it's like a whole, uh, whole system too. Water's coming from every direction. <laughs> yeah, that was, um with the sand dunes is something I had mentioned, um, as Richard just talked about, um, with the wave action from the beach side coming into the cove um, yeah. was really what I was trying to accomplish through that and taking that out and um, kind of rebuilding that area more so. Great, thank you. All right, Kevin, nice job. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> Miracles happen. There you go. Thanks, yeah, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> and, actually, I got Kevin's slides, but Kevin actually did this on his own. So this is coming directly from him. Okay. A couple extra clicks and you got it all set. So Richard, you tell us what you want to do. If you want to uh, just go into Kevin's. Let's go, uh, let's go on to Kevin's, okay? Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, there you go. All right. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Leon. Um, so my focus on waterfront resiliency on Juno ecological secession. So um, let's see, there we go. So as we all know, Watchill is located in Southern Rhode Island and it serves as a summer vacational site for people from throughout the country. The village's stakeholders also, um, with a commercial uh, district on site, it also serves as a great area for stakeholders to pursue investments. Um, when designing for Watchill, I decided to take a look into sea level rise since it's one of the site's biggest threats. The information on screen was collected from storm tools. In the diagrams, you can see the different impacts of sea level rise for three, five feet, seven feet, and 10 feet, and how the area will be flooded for each interval of sea level rise. On the right side, you can see that I showed the existing conditions of the site separated into three sections, the shoreline, the midland, and the upland. On the bottom, you can see um, how the three sections are affected by sea level rise. Um, for my design, I drew inspiration from the concept of life, which explains that all living forms must cease to exist into the same ease they came into existence, as you can see on this diagram. Um, with the concept of life, the concept of life also entails biological processes, which can be seen on this diagram. The purpose of representing both of these concepts is to portray Watchill as a living entity or an organism. 
Um, furthermore, I decided to expand the idea of wild chill as an organism by comparing it to a cell. In this diagram, you can see how I've broken up the essential components of wild chill and compared it to the different parts of a cell. This was done to further emphasize the portrayal of wild chill as a living entity and how it comes into play with the naturalistic approach I took for designing wild chill. So for my design, we can see the existing conditions on the left. The idea is to take the existing seawall barrier and maximize it by increasing it five feet of height and expanding it throughout the entire harbor. This will allow uh, to maximize the protection of the harbor, the dunes, and the commercial district while also maximizing the shoreline. Uh, furthermore, we can see, as we can also see the existing conditions on this diagram, the idea is for the deposition of sand to occur where the, har where the harbor parking lot is now. This would allow for sand accumulation to occur, which would also allow for dunal succession to occur as well. Um, at a regional scale, my objective is to restore the site into a resting and habitat point for migratory birds, and then at a neighborhood scale to create new access routes for residents and visitors. Can you hear me? No. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, at a site scale, my goals would be to maximize length of the shoreline, increase habitat zone through a natural dune succession, create new experiential sites for residents and visitors, mitigate sea level rise, provide better parking, and, pede and better pedestrian and vehicular safety. I don't know why this, okay. Um, in my master plan, you can see the different components that would be forming my design. Um, for the commercial district, I rearranged the structures. I created on-street diagonal backward parking. Um, I rehabilitated parking lots by, by adding vegetation. At the harbor, I um, expanded the seawall. Um, I created access points between the dunes and the dock as a first, uh, and then created, and then this would serve as a first defense for a sea level rise. With the dunes, I did, I expanded habitat. I created an experiential site uh, that would also serve as a learning tool where people would be able to go in and learn more about the community, the coastal community that would be there, um, and also created access routes between the commercial district and the dunes. And then I also decided to create on-street parking and then um, rehabilitated parking, like I said in the beginning. Um, so, with the dune succession, it would go into uh, five different stages. At the f first stage, a sand dune is created by deposition from large waves breaking offshore. Unobstructed winds carries the sand inland, and then pioneer plant communities invade the bay side of the bar. At stage two, dune formation begins at the thicket line with deposition of windblown sand. Wind deposits sand at the thicket line, and then dune grass spreads along north-south line of the sand accumulation. Um, at stage three, secondary dune formation begins at the dune grass community, and the dune grass community is established. Sand is removed. Sand is removed. Sand accumulates on the dune. Uh, wind removes sand in front of the dune, and then the thicket and woodland plants invade the rising back dune sand under the protection of the growing secondary dune. At stage four, the dune grass advances seaward on the high tide line. Primary dune from formation begins. Mesic conditions allow for dune grass communities to spread seaward. Thicket and woodland communities advance north and south behind the secondary dune. And then at stage five, the primary and secondary dunes are established. Uh, salt spray is reduced by the primary dune and the ground level rises. The secondary dune is stabilized. The dune grass is replaced by plants not requiring sand deposition. And then finally, uh, woodland is established behind the stabilized dune. So the overall idea of my design is to treat Wachel as if it was a living organism. Yes, designs can be implemented on site that can improve vehicular pedestrian circulation, enhance experiences and make the best out of the site. But when it comes to its overall resiliency and mitigating sea level rise, I believe it's best to approach it from a natural perspective that allows for you to work with the site's current conditions. And that would be my presentation. Okay. Very good. Um, I'd like to uh, continue on with the with the next four, and we'll talk about uh, Kevin's within that and confine of the uh, the other four. Okay, for the sake of time, let's get back on to 
I want to get back on the schedule. So, um, Kevin, hang on. We'll comment on yours when we get done with uh, Kristen's and uh, Phil's and Connor's and Madison's. Okay, so you'll be in that group as we um, as we make comments. That would be great. Um, okay, let's go on to Kristen. Okay, hi, my name is Kristen, and I will be talking about my um, idea of the living shorelines within Watch Hill, Westerly, Rhode Island. So um, some of the benefits of a living shoreline are that they're both beautiful and practical. They're a low maintenance green space. They can provide focal points for people to gather, and um, they also provide benefits to the environment and to people like purifying water, buffer, buffering floods, reducing erosion, storing carbon, and attracting wildlife. And it's been shown that a natural shoreline performs better during um, major storms when compared to a hardened shoreline. And this is from the NOAA website. So for precedent, I looked at um, a couple projects to inspire um, my design and um, this one I'm showing is in Allen's Cove in Barrington, Rhode Island. And these pictures are actually from Janet, who's joined us today. Um, and I used, like I said, this project to inspire my design. So the concept for my design is using vegetation to stabilize on the area and prevent erosion and also filter the water, as well as um, supporting people to, supporting wildlife and reconnecting people to um, wildlife, and this is all incorporated in my proposed, proposed um, living shoreline idea. So the area I decided to focus on was the Watch Hill Cove area, um, just off of Napa Tree Point. Um, here's a close up of it, and I am showing the three foot sea level rise, which we were told to focus on by the Nature Conservancy, and also my proposed added green space um, which would be connected to the existing green space that's already along Bay Street that would um, sort of connect or extend uh, Napa Tree Point. Um, and I have two cross sections, one in front of the cabanas and one um, that goes through Bay Street in front of the businesses and what the living shoreline would look like in front of these areas. So in front of the cabanas, I have the um, an implemented replenished dune and then um, the road would be raised um, with also porous pavement and then it extends into the living shoreline which offers a raised walkway along the seawall. And then in front of the businesses, a similar look, I uh, kept the on-street parking um, which again leads into the living shoreline and then a raised walkway as well and um, a raised seawall along there because the seawall is uh, pretty low there. And for some plants, this is just a little bit of a plant list. Uh, some plants that would offer um, beneficial fruit for the birds that um, visit Napa Tree Point, like beech heather or beech plum, um, bayberry, common juniper, and obviously um, grasses like American beech grass, salt meadow, cord grass, seaside goldenrod, and then switch grass. And this is what um, Conceptually, I was seeing that it would look like with um, still emergency vehicle access to Napa Tree Point, and then um, pedestrians can have the option um, to walk more safely along the seawall with the raised walkway. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Phil. All right, just a moment. I need to get this into presentation mode. Oh, now I gotta get it on the right screen. <laughs> um, all right, so share the screen. All right, um, should already be in presentation mode. Uh, you are. Um, uh, 
All right. Well, this is all I can do right now. Um, so my channel or my project is called the Watch Hill Living Fortress, and pretty soon you will see why. Um, so some of the challenges that we uh, looked at when going to Watch Hill were that uh, eventually by 2050, there will be a three foot sea level rise. Uh, and by uh, 2100, there'll be a nine foot plus uh, sea level rise level, uh, level of sea, uh, the, the water will rise nine foot plus by then. Um, there's always the chance of a hundred year storm, which is about 1% each year, uh, which could devastate uh, downtown Watch Hill if it were to hit. Uh, we can't stop sea level from rising. Uh, we can't stop climate change and we might as well, um, uh, unless we're going to retreat and move the entire downtown Watch Hill somewhere else, we're going to have to fortify it uh, against this rising sea level and a um, hundred year storms. Parts of the Watch Hill, uh, particularly uh, the Fort Road uh, parking lot and the parking lot behind the livery already flood uh, during king tides and uh, storms. And some of the uh, more uh, proactive uh, changes that I, I want to make sure that we could do is is uh, keep the historic culture and the use of Bay Street. Uh, keep that that feeling that people get when they come to the town and visit as tourists. Uh, encourage people uh, and make uh, tourism easier, uh, give people more things to do, more space to do it, and also benefit the local ecosystem uh, in a way uh, that will sort of mitigate or or offset any potential changes that could be made in, with this solution. Uh, and my solution, we're gonna have to put in a wall. I'm basing this off of uh, the Seattle seawall uh, where they took it and um, sort of improved it by uh, taking their seawall but adding a sort of habitat for the local salmon population uh, corridor for them and uh, adding artificial reefs, allowing uh, new wildlife to enter where before with their former seawall, it wasn't able to. So my solution is build an 18 foot stone seawall to protect against 100 year storms and a 10, potentially 10 foot uh, sea level rise. Uh, raise up the area uh, to meet that wall about 15 feet so that there's a three foot lip. Um, uh, keep the historic culture in use by keeping the original layout. So, so keep the layout as it is right now, uh, but raise it up pretty much to meet the uh, 15 foot contour of the land. Uh, create new green space uh, and expand the green space that exists right now so that so there's more space for tourists and uh, create a new uh, habitat to encourage a, a healthy local ecosystem. Uh, so this is my master plan. As you can see, it has already, uh, there's some extension of the land out into the bay. Um, but I want to offset this, uh, I'll explain later, with a new habitat for uh, the local wildlife. Uh, there's an 18-foot seawall stopping waves from both the west and the southwest. Um, so facing the ocean where most of the waves will be coming and in the chance of a 100-year storm uh, inside Watch Hill Cove as well. And this is an initial idea of what it might look like uh, facing out, uh, I guess, to the southwest. Uh, there's a 15-foot fill, making sure that the entire area is level with the 15-foot contour line of, of the land. Uh, I want to keep the original uh, Bay Street layout with its buildings in place, but also expanding the parking area, uh, the Fort Road uh, parking spaces, and also expanding the amount of parking spaces in the upper, uh, upper lot as well as defining some spaces in the livery so there can be more of a, uh, an efficient way for people to be able to park there, uh, adding up to about 300 parking spots for the entire area. And um, adding to the current green space that uh, you have, uh, there's the lawn there and that, that uh, Chief Nugret statue area with the walkway there. I wanna expand that so that there's three and a half acres. Uh, this area could be used for uh, farmer's markets uh, it could be used for local festivals, uh, just giving uh, the opportunity for more cultural events to take place and giving people more space to walk instead of uh, having to walk just so close to the road. Um, I, uh, as a consultant, I wanted to uh, sort of suggest that a formal garden would be a good idea for this new green space, uh, just because um, it's a very 
affluent area, but and people also love formal gardens. Um, like I, I used Versailles as as my uh, sort of inspiration for that. It's not the same layout, but um, just an idea. Uh, this is what that formal garden could look like. Uh, it could be herbs, uh, there'd be hedges, trimmed fountains, or a fountain at least, uh, with a nice view of the bay. And uh, for the lawn that's currently there, it could be expanded, moving the gazebo into a center uh, that I, I took some inspiration from the quad at URI uh, with some of the crisscrossing walkways. And uh, this is what it could look like as well. Maybe adding some trees for shade, uh, breaking up that that horizon and um, just giving giving it more life than just a, a bland a blank space. Uh, but you can see there's plenty of room if people wanted to have events, uh, farmers markets and et cetera. I also wanted to add a um, 20 foot wide uh, see-through deck that would extend out from the uh, seawall and about uh, seven feet below or, or halfway up the wall. And I think that this would give people the chance to, um, here's a, a view of it, give people a view of the wildlife that will be going on underneath it, um, learn a little bit about the local ecosystem, and uh, just give people more of a, um, an, an activity that, that they'll be able to take part in. Uh, as you can see, underneath the uh, wall or underneath the see-through deck, there would be a habitat bench. That's where I drew inspiration from the uh, Seattle seawall. Uh, it would give a corridor for small crustaceans, uh, small fish, and uh, other wildlife to uh, be able to live during a low tide or during a high tide, uh, protected by an artificial reef space, which would give um, more crustaceans and, and small uh, animals the ability to hide from predators and uh, encourage local uh, flora, uh, sea flora uh, to grow. Um, and also make sure that the, I, I wanna make sure that all the new pavement is permeable. <laughs> Uh, so these are just some examples that I've found of, of different artificial reefs and tide pools that could be placed into the area. Uh, one of them, an underwater museum of sculptures that has quickly turned into a reef itself. Concrete structures, pillars, um, all with the intention of encouraging wildlife uh, to uh, grow in this cove that might not be growing as it is right now. Uh, so this will be a multi-phase uh, project, just like the, Boston, the filling of Boston, which I, I drew in a, a, uh, some inspiration from. Uh, by 2025, I would like to start this by filling in the bay um, up to a certain point. Uh, and then uh, that would be raised up about five feet to meet with the land currently. By 2035, I want to expand, make sure that the land is meeting the seven foot um, contour line. By phase three, I want it to be at about the uh, nine to 10 contour line. And by phase four, by 2055, I'd like to start on um, a fin finishing the final product um, at the 15 foot uh, contour line. Uh, this would be to break up the, the project so that it costs less, allowing for new technologies to come in and uh, make it easier for this to happen without disrupting the tourist season or any of the businesses um, pretty much raising up the buildings uh, to meet that uh, new elevation as well. So thank you. That's my, my presentation. Do you have any questions? Um, let's see. Zoom. Connor. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Am I oh. still sharing? Oh, there we go. Okay. You got eyes on that? Yes. Perfect. So I'm Connor Sullivan, um, and my project is the Watch Hill Resurgence, um, focusing in Westerly Rhode Island. So my goals for the overall site were to um, install a vegetative berm, which would raise access to Napa Tree Point and also protect Watch Hill Business District. Um, do a seawall vertical extension. So raising the seawall would aid in the protection during occasional flooding and spring high tides, as well as uh, partial storm surge. Um, parking lot relocation to allow for less impervious pavement. Uh, a road width and duct reduction to promote pedestrian traffic and reduce vehicular. 
um, and then seasonal business slash public facility pots that would allow for new businesses to come in during tourist seasons. So moving forward, my base map, um, I've reduced road widths um, going down the main uh, business Bay Street to one way, but only allowing two way for access drop off point down in Apple Tree Point, as well as getting back to this parking garage that I've installed. Um, seasonal huts along the edge and then a vegetative berm that runs all the way around. So getting into it, existing access to Napa Tree Point, as you see, it's just pavement um, next to the water. So as we've seen when we went there for the site, there's a lot of uh, flooding in that area. So moving forward, my proposed design would be a vegetative berm um, raised six feet above the existing um, ground that would allow for um, pedestrians and vehiculars vehicles, sorry, to have access out to Napa Tree Point. Um, it would be uh, consist of native herbaceous and shrub material as a fill to act as a filtering buffer with permeable pavement on top to allow for water filtration uh, into the ground. And then the seawall height would be raised two feet to in spring high tide and occasional flooding prevention. So just another visual of what uh, this vegetative berm could look like. And then as you see, this would be such as an existing image, and then moving forward to what six feet of sea level rise could look like with the site. As you see, um, it doesn't affect the road and vehicles are still able to access Napa Tree Point. So seasonal huts, I thought this would be a nice little touch to the area. Um, it would allow for small businesses or public facilities, such as restrooms or town storage. Um, they'd be located just across from the main businesses on Bay Street. They could be movable in the event of a storm, although the uh, stainless steel marine grade um, elevators for ADA access would not be, but those would be able to withstand, I believe, winds up to 70 miles an hour and flooding. Um, they would feature tiered seating overlooking the bay uh, to allow tourists and locals to like to relax away from the beach while overlooking the harbor and would be able to um, allow small businesses, artisans, or um, restrooms and stuff like that to be underneath. So it's a two for one deal. So my parking garage, just over here um, in that barren empty lot that's already existing with the unstructured parking, I proposed a three story parking garage that can house up to 300 cars and condenses parking on site. Um, it'll have a rooftop garden to aid in water filtration, as well as offsetting the carbon footprint, as well as vertical plantings along the edges to limit visual intrusion for um, the neighbors of the site and blend the garage into the site as best as we can. So just another visual up top, this would be overlooking, the bay would be over here. So it'd be a place for people to um, get a little information about the site. These plaques could feature stuff about um, sustainability and the actual purpose of why the parking garage is the way that it is and just trying to limit the parking scattered throughout the site. Just another visual and that is it. Thank you. Uh, Madison. Madison, you muted still. Madison, can you hear us? There you go. I just unmuted her. Okay, thank you. Madison, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, Madison? I think we need to go on. Uh, Okay, Madison, can you wave if you can hear us? We can see you, but we can't hear you. She must not be able to hear us. Yeah, Richard, let's go on. Yeah, let's go. Uh, this is uh, the break that uh, we'll we'll talk about uh, Kevin's, uh, Kristen's, uh, Phillips, and Connor's, uh, you know, solutions are. Uh, and so uh, I'm opening up the floor to anybody that uh, 
would like to uh, start the discussion on those uh, four people. And I uh, appreciate anything you can do. <laughs> I will start. Um, I'm happy to start. Um, I, I want to say to um, all four of you, and actually I'm going to include um, Spencer and Joe too, for the students that included a sea level rise sequence in your um, illustrations, I really appreciate that. And I think it's a really nice way to, you know, just show what the problem is, what the, sorry, what the challenge is. And I think incorporating that illustration into your design sequence is so effective and I think will be really helpful for conversations in um, with the Watch Hill Conservancy moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think, um, for me, um, again, you guys are drawing inspiration from very cool places. You all had a little different take on what area of focus um, you had. I really appreciated, Phil, the reference to the engineering of the wall. Uh, you have, a, you have a, a lot of infrastructure that you've proposed in your, in your design, but I appreciated the phasing plan. I appreciated the um, thinking about the height of the wall, how much fill would be required long term. Um, and you really did put a lot of thought. It's a big, ambitious plan, but I think that you went there is exciting. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, I guess the other thing is, uh, Connor, on your seasonal huts, I first wrote down seasonal huts question mark. And um, then, you know, you, you talked through it. it. It makes sense to have like maybe a, a it kind of keeps a liveliness to the space of these kind of, you know, pop-ups that could happen um, you know, every season, it could be a little bit different in terms of what the experience is. So I'm just wondering, are there any, could you talk about where you got the inspiration for those seasonal huts? I, so the only, uh, I guess, inspiration I was thinking was to draw like uh, local craftsmen and stuff like that, like mm -hmm. to give them a place, I guess, where the main tourists, uh, I guess, uh, are located during the uh, summer months just a place to, I guess, showcase their work, maybe sell it. Some of them could also offer like kayak rentals and stuff like that to create new experiences. I know that there were surfboards, but. Are they temporary structures or are they permanent structures? They could be moved. Okay. Okay, great. The only, the thing I would suggest to you um, uh, as you're, again, putting this into your port, I'm kind of thinking about you guys applying for jobs after this and what you put into your portfolio. The visuals that you put that you share with us atop the parking lot, the parking structure that you proposed, um, doesn't really show the context. So if you could rethink some of those perspectives from the top, you know that those those images could be anywhere. But I think having a some sort of background of Watch Hill Harbor or Napa Tree Point, just so that you're also capturing the view of the the area, would be really helpful your eye is really drawn to, you know, those spaces that you're creating on top of that parking structure. But I think you just need to think about putting that in context of your space. Um, other than that, Kristen, I loved your plant list um, and the fact that you really thought about the plants. And the, um, the question I have for you has to do with maintenance of your living shoreline. Did you think through any type of um, maintenance requirements that like the Watch Hill Conservancy, the fire district or other stakeholders might have to, um, per, you know, might have to, um, you know, uh, upkeep uh, long term. Yeah, I think definitely there would, there's a need for a maintenance plan um, okay. for my um, project. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you guys. Nice job. Thanks. Anything from you, Pete? Um, quick question for Joe. I, I couldn't tell on your uh, illustrations. Um, are you retaining vehicle access out to the beach club uh, on that Fort Road section? So, the, uh, no, but what I, and what I did, um, it might be easier if I hold on a second. I'll, I'm going to share my screen quickly so I can kind of. It's probably easier to explain. I added a um, in my master plan. So I, I did like I don't know if you can see my cursor. I did take away um, vehicular access over here, but um, to kind of compensate for that, I added 
a parking lot right here and I added vehicular access here. Um, so they can, if you're going to the cabanas or if you're going to the beach club, you can uh, park a car here and then walk along the boardwalk um, to the beach club or to the cabanas. Great, thank you. And just a, a, a comment, a couple of you have suggested using um, kind of engineered concrete designs to increase the uh, habitat complexity on the Bayside seawall front. I think that is a very interesting um, idea and might be a really effective way of, of uh, uh, offering protection for the community but could really enhance the habitat quality of that uh, waterfront line. So I, I really enjoyed um, hearing that idea pop up in uh, some of the presentations. So good job on that. Professor, this is Deborah Lamb. Could I, could I ask a couple of questions and make a couple of observations? Please do. Thank you. Uh, for everybody here, I'm, I'm the current chairman of the Watch Hill Conservancy, one of your, your stakeholders here. And first of all, I wanted to applaud all of you for your um, broad vision and fresh thinking. Uh, this has been really exciting to watch all of your presentations here. Um, this last group, I was particularly, uh, like Teresa, particularly impressed with your using storm tools to inform your, uh, your solution design. Um, or your vision uh, to, to change going forward. Um, it showed up in a lot of different uh, folks' uh, presentations, but I, I think following up a point that Pete was just making that vehicular access, um, at least as a drop-off situation for the beach club, the cabanas, all of those things is very important. We do have a, a a nice senior community here that like to get out and about and use those facilities and really aren't able to make those long walks. So being able to consider that population um, would be an important thing there. Um, I really liked in Phil's uh, presentation where he showed uh, the maze of walkways going around and hit some of his open space design. I think that's super important. What we found is that folks will take the shortest path, whether you build it for them or not. So, so to give some, some people some access to, you know, cross big swaths of natural is, uh, is gonna be important because they'll find their own path, whether you give it to them or not. Um, I am really impressed by the garage design. Uh, who did that, Connor? Um, that's the most spectacular garage I've ever seen, and I'm a New York City resident, so I hope they build something like that. <laughs> where they really do have structural garages. That's really spectacular. I also think that the, one of the things that was important about that was that the viewpoint from a higher elevation can be really spectacular in Watch Hill if you can be able to look down on things, and so that structure allowed you that kind of perspective, which you don't really see very often. Um, Phil, I was so impressed by the uh, grandeur of your solution. Um, I was wondering though, as you, as you ease into an 18 foot seawall, um, how you would be, uh, Chris had mentioned this earlier with some other folks, you know, thinking about the view from the property owners on the other side of Bay Street, you know, how you're, you know, preserving that in terms of being able to have a connection to the water would be something that I, that I saw as a challenge there. And I couldn't quite tell from your renderings um, if you were elevating that side of Bay Street as well, or if you were leaving that down and then building a big hill that they were gonna look into. So that might be something that would be for clarification in your, in your plans. But generally I'm impressed with all of your work um, and your, uh, your ability to remain grounded in reality, like storm tools, and yet still be visionary and, and um, imaginative. Uh, the one other thing I did want to mention is that I agree with Pete, I really love these structures in the water and the things that would be, you know, working to increase the habitat, water quality, etc. there. The thing I would caution is that oftentimes that cove needs to be dredged periodically. 
that, that sand and things do fill in there. So the more structure you're gonna put there, the more it's gonna grab that, that sand and that could fill faster. So that's just something to think about. While you wanna increase that habitat, you also wanna let that sand flow through and, and continue to allow that to be a, a, um, a less solid water body. So the end, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, let's go on to the last three. And um, Ryan, you're gonna start off the line and then Seth and then Nick. All right, one second, let's see. Aha, uh -huh. all right. Uh, transitioned. Okay, slideshow from beginning. All right, everybody, uh, my name is Ryan Rodriguez and I am here to tell you about my design. So my take on it, I named it the Watch Hill Phalanx. Um, this, oh, oh, can I get rid of this one second? I can't see, ah. This design focuses on the Bay Street area specifically and how it aims to defend the area from the rising waters. It raises the seawall as well as the surrounding land around it by six feet, meeting the 2100 prediction of seven feet of sea level rise. It also focuses on the reduction of pavement by turning Bay Street into a one-way access road, getting rid of the parking lots and allowing access parking to be done at the Larkin Road parking lot while using a shuttle system to take tourists and travelers to Watch Hill from outside sources, such as the Westerly Airport. It also utilizes raised berms as a second tier defense near the seawall, making it a raised walk and using rain gardens and a pergola walk to ensure a walkable environment. I got my little uh, name from an explorer named Giovanni in 1524, who made the connection to the Isle of Rhodes of the Greek islands to Rhode Island, where I grabbed the term phalanx, named after the Greek term of combat defense. And so a little bit about the shuttle system and the travel time it would take. And from Westerly Airport, it would take 10 minutes. And then from Musquamish at State Beach, it would be 11 minutes. But naturally, travel time is impacted by speed, weather, and traffic. And for a bus, there will be multiple stops. So it's going to take longer than that. But that is the drive from there to there without any interruptions. Now, the benefits to green space is that, in general, this brings communities together. It makes the area more desirable and encourages people to be fit and healthy. It relieves stress. It is useful in engaging with wildlife, and it helps reduce crime and antisocial behavior. Now, this is the Watch Hill Phalanx, which um, it has a pond with integrated Chief Nitigrit statue at the top. Uh, there's a one-way road with bike lane and rain gardens. There is a raised walk in the middle with in the pergola walk, and is, oh, there is also at the bottom open space for recreation. Now, the term road dieting is just the reduction of the road itself into a more complete street, for example. Now, um, the road dieting itself for here is the reduction of lanes from two lanes to one lane. It adds a bike lane as well as a rain garden off to the left. There is a raised berm as well as the raised seawall. Uh, there's a pergola walk along sidewalk with vegetation instead of trees to keep the view as much as possible for the um, for the second floor residents and, and it is a permeable walk with pavements. Now for the raised berm walk, it's only four feet tall. So you if anybody over five feet will still be able to see over it. <clears throat> it includes native plantings such as American beach grass and forsythia. It includes a raised walk that stretches along Bay Street. It will not be obstructing views due to the low shrubbery, and it is also a permeable walk. Now for the pergola walk, that is my, um, as like, as just a, a way to reduce, like, it's just to give it more greenery. So it will be covered in ivy plantings for a vegetative walk and it offers shaded walking on site, and it will be a permeable walk. And that is my presentation. Let me stop sharing. All right. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Okay, Seth. All right, hello everyone. Thank you uh, <coughs> for me. We're all very, very interesting. Um, my concept is the Fort Road Harbor Walk, and I titled that Landscaping Resilience to Combat Sea Level Rise in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Quick summary of the presentation. Um, the problem is no, no predictions currently indicate uh, sea level rise is going to be about three feet in 2050. 
Um, Watch Hill is extremely vulnerable to sea level rise and storm surge. Um, there's really limited real estate to install mitigation solutions. And we also have to consider the cultural aspects of Watch Hill, uh, preserving those and trying to you know, maintain the existing way of life down there. People, people really don't like change. Hey Seth, um, are you, you're not sharing your screen with us. Oh, I'm not? Nope. No. All right, let me back up then, sorry. Thank you, it's okay. You missed all my good slides. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? There we go, there it is, thank you. Yeah, I can't see anything, okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, my project is the Fort Road Harbor Walk. Um, there's a quick presentation overview. Um, the problem as I indicated is sea level rise. Um, some of the goals I set for this project for myself was to de design an implementable solution, something that was, you know, maybe could be brought into um, quick production by a professional, you know, architect. Um, I also wanted to improve the public safety down there in the um, Fort Road area, um, explore what other coastal communities are doing to combat sea level rise, and then design a solution that can provide uh, ecosystem services. Some, some ecosystem services are uh, you know, biofiltration that improves water quality, um, beneficial food value for um, migrating birds and pollinators. So we started with a site visit, a site assessment using the storm tools model. Um, this yellow shows the 2030 sea level. You could see 2040 in the darker blue and then the light blue is the 2050. So basically by 2050, all the parking lot for the beach club and the cabana parking is completely you know, inaccessible. So in a no action scenario, you're gonna have approximately 50% parking loss in the Bay Street area. Um, it's also an issue for public access to Napa Tree Point and for emergency vehicle access. So what are other coastal areas doing? Well, there's actually published you know, guidelines for coastal infrastructure, um, green infrastructure for the coast, um, living shorelines in New England by the Nature Conservancy, uh, Climate Ready Boston, we took a lot of inspiration from that. Um, I really wanted to focus on the planting design for this project to choose coastal Rhode Island native plants that are basically already adapted to that environment. They're not going to struggle there. They're going to be successful and allow them to, you know, not require a ton of replacement and maintenance. Um, also, we want to maximize the food benefit to migrating birds and pollinators. Um, that was another URI study I found that, you know, cited all the protein content available for um, different, different birds and pollinators. And my design is basically uh, conducting, uh, constructing a raised seawall along um, Fort Road, uh, along with enlarging a 12-foot uh, um, walking pedestrian lane that could also be used for ATV emergency access down to Napa Tree Point. We would have a little tiered um, accessible ramp here that would tear down to the existing grade. Um, the net loss is about 55 parking spaces to incorporate this design. Um, I was able to maintain parking and access to the beach parking lot and then there's still some parking lot available here. Um, this is the new two-way traffic lane kind of over in the blue. And then in between the um, harbor walk and the um, new drive lanes is a, a bioswale, vegetated buffer, and that will basically provide pedestrian access and then filtration of stormwater runoff. Um, these are just some of the plants I had selected. And then around the carousel, I wanted to kind of protect that historic aspect. And I came up with this side deployed flex wall from the Boston Climate uh, Solutions that basically it can be deployed by one person. It kind of remains on site and then you just pull it out and it goes around the carousel. So here's a section showing the new raised seawall. Um, existing sea level is right here, uh, zero feet. So here's a predicted sea level about three feet. So we're, we're going up about uh, 24 inches above that. And then um, I'm also gonna implement a living seawall at various locations along the outside to break up the you know, rec rectangular man-made edge and provide some increased uh, marine biodiversity. There's lots of precedents for this. Um, this is in Fort Lauderdale. This is the Opera House or the uh, Convention Center in Vancouver. Um, and these are Volvo actually designed some custom 3D tiles that can get bolted right to the wall, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, as you can see, here's the walk path and this is all permeable pavement and um, crushed stone underneath to increase the pore space and the water storage for runoff. Um, so that's the gist of my design. Uh, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, you're next. Yep, just a minute. All right, can you see my whole screen here? Yeah, it's small. Okay, yeah, no, I'm playing it right now. Just loading the presentation. There we go. All right, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Murata, and I first want to thank you all for being so resourceful to our class throughout this entire semester and for hanging out till the end of our presentations today. I'm last. So I'll be giving a very quick overview of my watch shell resiliency strategy, and I'll be breaking it down into three main points. So here's an aerial view of the conditions of the site, the watch hill cove area, which we all know and love. And here's the future conditions of the site with a projected three feet sea level rise by 2050, courtesy of Storm Tools, uh, which is the scenario that we're gonna be designing for, that we were charged to design for. So I'll jump right into it with the full master plan of the site. You can see that my design intervention extends from all the way to the Watch Hill Conservancy, just about down towards the parking lot and actually past the cabanas towards the beach club. So this is the three foot sea level rise overlay on top of my master plan. So the blue here doesn't actually represent where the water would be with these interventions, but rather where it would be before the interventions. So you'll notice that the areas with the most extensive, um, the most extensive inundation have been designed for with maximum mitigation strategies. So as I said, I'll break down the design into three major parts. First is the meandering green belt that is an extension of the existing two green open spaces. Uh, the second would be a boardwalk that weaves throughout and adjacent to these new green spaces. And then finally, a shift in the most vulnerable buildings and parking configuration is necessary to preserve this town for decades to come. So uh, the green belt is composed of a series of gently sloping three foot grassy hills, which are the new first line of defense in the event of a three foot sea level rise scenario. <laughs> the idea here was to create green infrastructure that was high enough to mitigate the three feet of sea level rise, but low enough so as to not obstruct the view sheds from storefronts, which is really valuable in this area, obviously. Um, additionally, with the implementation of more natural green spaces, we could also welcome pollinators into the site and also provide more areas for bird migration as uh, Southern Rhode Island is a critical global rest stop for migratory birds. <laughs> and also appropriate signage would be helpful here in educating the patrons who stroll through the area to learn a little bit more about the history of Watch Hill and the natural systems alike. Some of these signs already exist in Napa Three Point, so I thought it'd be a great idea to expand that all the way to the um, observatory. So again, we'll look back at sea level rise and take note how the areas of extensive inundation are mostly covered with the new uh, by the new green spaces, right? So then the second element of this design is the boardwalk, which weaves throughout and adjacent to, as I said before, the newly proposed green areas. So there's a number of observation areas which make the boardwalk not only a dynamic space, but also one which is suitable for reflection and contemplation. In my opinion, uh, the most exciting part of this boardwalk experience is the point at which the boardwalk actually extends out over the water and it is fitted with a net inspired by a sailboat net or like a catamaran sort of net. So this one actually enables patrons to lay down and interact with the rising and falling tides. So at some point, this net will become inundated with sea level rise and will serve as a stark reminder to the people who use the site that climate change is in fact a real threat and a threat that hits close to home. Uh, in addition to the fun element of this segment of the boardwalk, it also serves as a water taxi terminal, which allows for more patrons, more cash flow, but fewer cars in the area. And so as this boardwalk continues towards the cabanas and beach club, I was met with a challenge of maintaining access for emergency vehicles, which uh, made continuing the green belt especially difficult. So I approached this challenge with the transition from the on-land style boardwalk to an overhang boardwalk with watertight construction and set at a three foot elevation, again, to protect the emergency access road and cabanas from the threat of sea level rise. This also provides a continued experience and makes for a more appropriately tied together space from Watch Hill Conservancy all the way to Napa Tree Point. And then finally, the last part of this design was the shifting of the lowest lying, most vulnerable buildings, the buildings that Storm Tools indicates are the most vulnerable in our scenario that we're designing for, actually to the back corner of the triangular lot near the carousel. So in doing this, we significantly increase our chances of these buildings withstanding three feet of sea level rise and simultaneously allow for the extension of the green belt, which is the new main line of defense for this town. And so this is a little drone perspective to give sort of an overall um, aerial view. And I'll close with that. 
uh, I think that was about three minutes, maybe a little more. So thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that's it. And uh, let's uh, <clears throat> let's open it up for discussion on uh, Ryan, Seth's and uh, Nick's presentations. Can I just say one thing, Nick? I'm sad that you killed the island. <laughs> yeah, I'm sad that I killed the island as well. So, but Pete's real stuff. happy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a couple of you had explored islands throughout the semester, and I think that I know Kevin early on was also looking at uh, an offshore, some sort of island wave attenuation structure. And, um, you know, I think that, it, and you guys thinking it through, um, it's a pretty complex idea. So I appreciate that you went there, but I also think it was wise to um, consider it and move on. <laughs> <laughs> How diplomatic. You. <laughs> um, well, I have the floor. I'll just um, I, I I just wanted to mention that you know I, all three of these have I think some aspects that are very doable and seemingly you know they could be constructed in some form short term, mid term, long term. So I really um, appreciated that in all three of these uh, presentations. Um, Ryan, your you know concept of the um, the combat defense or the phalanx from the the Greek uh, reference, I think starting off with that, since you mentioned the word, and the first thing that went to my mind is like, you know, what is that? Um, getting into that right away instead of sort of you read off a lot of the text on your slides, and I think that you know um, that's one of your guiding concepts. So start off with that um, when you sort of present this in other in other um, formats. I love that you talked about road diet, complete street, and that concept. So, you know, keep going with that. I think that's a really um, thoughtful and thorough concept to throw out to in this, in this, um, in this area. Um, Seth, I also really appreciated your very clear presentation and um, really great use of simple graphics that complemented your section. The, um, your, I love the color-coded legend with the vines around it. It was really clear to follow your, your site plan. So I really just like those kinds of small details are really nice to navigate um, the stories that you guys are telling. Um, I actually learned that from Pete August. Hey. In GIS class. <laughs> All right. Comes full circle. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I do have a question for Nick. Um, Nick, nice relationship with your sea level rise coverages that we've already talked about in terms of using storm tools and bringing that in to illustrate how your design works with that. Um, your plan view design reminded me when I was a student in landscape architecture many years ago, um, I got um, some constructive feedback on a, um, a, a shape that I had put out into the water very similar to your trapezoid and was asked what was the design reference or the the influence for that spatial pattern. Um, so I'm just wondering if you consider that with the net, the net part of it is very interesting and I'm not gonna go there, but I'm more interested in sort of that landform and if it relates to any history or um, what the function of it needs to be. I'm, I'm kind of thinking like to, to really go a little bit deeper into the design of that to have it reference some sort of history of Watch Hill. So I don't know if you had a reason for sort of designing it in that sort of rigid trapezoid um, pattern. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, no, there, there was no historical reference there with that, uh, with that shape. But the real uh, reason for the trapezoidal shape was to um, make for easy docking for a water taxi or for a ferry. I mean, to have a really artful sort of uh, dock might make it a little bit difficult to, to get that boat in. So I wanted it to double as a fun space, but also as a functional space for transportation hub. But I, but I definitely hear you. I think it's a great comment and could definitely be workshopped more into a little bit more of an artful form. So thank you. That's it for me. Thank you guys. This is, this is Chris. Can I make a couple of comments? Oh, first, I, I, I apologize. I had to step away in the middle of the last session. So I saw half of Phil's and then I missed a few and then I came back for Ryan. So I apologize for those that I missed. I will, I'm actually gonna, I'm interested in this. So I will go back and look at the video when, uh, when it's posted because I think especially 
you know, I, I, am, I wanna echo some of the comments that I'm really impressed with the use of the tools that you're using. I, it's nice for us to see that uh, you're using storm tools and science-based tools to, to make some decisions. So I think that's, it sort of, uh, it, it validates the goal of this type of class where we're bringing people with different disciplines uh, and learning from each other. I, the thing that I like about watching these presentations is I really appreciate sort of the subtlety and the nuance that you guys bring to solutions. As engineers, we, we, like, we like sledgehammers a lot of times. And so when I look at the elegance of your presentations, I'm a little jealous because we tend to be uh, kind of clunky and, uh, and, and we love our models. And, uh, and so I, I really like watching these, these presentations and seeing uh, you try to illustrate a vision. Um, I do have one comment. I also, I, two, two more comments. I, I really appreciate the focus on parking. That's probably something that has been conveyed to you a lot about a big issue. Again, from an engineering point of view, we have not been thinking about that real issue uh, as much. And so I like the, the effort that you guys put into, into that. I think that's really important. Um, I do wanna say we've focused on sea level rise a lot because of course, we, we've, we heard early on, you know, 100 year storms, those are, those, are, those are beasts that we can't really deal with in this type of scenario. But I, I do want you to appreciate that if we design seawalls for three feet of sea level rise, when we do have that three feet of sea level rise, the, the frequency of storms that are gonna impact our structures will go way up. So what is now a, a 20 year storm or, a, or even a Hurricane Sandy, like a 50 year storm will occur more frequently. So if, you've got, if we've got three feet of sea level rise, it may not take, we may have storms more often that are impacting uh, those, those defenses. So even, even smaller nor'easters and, and, uh, and, and tropical storms may start affecting uh, the community. So I know it really wasn't the mission here, but uh, we, although we're focusing on sea level rise mostly, I think uh, the frequency of storms might be an issue as well uh, in some of those designs. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say is, I heard some inside talk about an island, and I would have liked to have seen that uh, island. I think that would have been pretty cool. So uh, I, next, maybe you could send me that the, the first draft of the presentation because uh, that would that sounded interesting. So with that, I, I'm just going to say good job. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I did get a note from Jocelyn that she has a comment. So Jocelyn, I will unmute. Oh, there you go. You're unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, for those who don't know, I'm the executive director of the Conservancy, and I just wanted to thank you for all of the efforts that you put in. This was a really enjoyable um, morning, and I just wanted to make a comment that um, what I saw throughout everybody's presentations is that while we have a sea level rise and storm surge planning goal, it's also important to keep Watch Hill that special place that everyone knows. It has this sense of place. And so the two things that I really loved that I saw in a couple of presentations um, was continuing that walkway that's Bayside all the way to Napa Tree. That's heavily used. And I think that there is sort of this break in that experience once you get to that parking area and once you get to the Fort Road area and now you're walking in a, a driving space. So I really love those ideas. Um, and I think it'd be excellent for public safety as well as enjoyment. And then, um, turning that green space, those um, you know, functional and usable green spaces and as into an experience as well, I think is just adding to the value of implementing them. So I, I really enjoyed seeing those in the presentations as well. So thanks everyone for, for what you did. <clears throat> I'd just like to mention, I screwed up. Um, <laughs> Madison. Can you hear us now? Doesn't sound like she can. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I included her. Um, you know, she had some interesting things. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you uh, for your input and uh, your kindness to my students. It's a, it's been, it's been an incredibly interesting half a semester for us as it's been for all of you. I, uh, I've been a prisoner to my kitchen here and uh, you know, I've spent way too much time and uh,
but I just want to say that the two classes that I have of URI students have been incredibly supportive to this uh, old uh, professor and uh, have made it much easier to work with. They, everybody has stepped up helping each other. There's a bonding that's gone on in the, in the classroom that's been quite unique and quite wonderful. Uh, you know, it's like, I know what these people have, uh, the students have in their back pockets. They were limited to three minutes. Yeah, Phil, you went to nine minutes, um, but that's okay. Uh, you were enthusiastic about what you were talking about. It's okay. Uh, and, but, and it's, but they've all helped each other and they've got immense amounts of knowledge that they're walking away from this project with. And I just want to thank Isabella for uh, connecting us with, uh, <coughs> with ocean engineering. She did a great job. And, uh, <coughs> and I also want to thank uh, Spencer for acting and Joe is acting as liaisons. And, <coughs> and it's been really, it's been really unique to see this actually happening. And, um, and I think that we're all gonna remember the spring of 2020 with mixed emotions and mixed feelings and how we all dealt with it and so forth. But I just wanna thank you know, all of you for um, helping the students have a real learning experience that's gonna help them find jobs when things open up because we're gonna have to focus in on infrastructure, community design, community input, and we're gonna to have to deal with it in a new and different way. And we're gonna to have to hit the road running very quickly to get things going again. So anyways, I just wanna thank you all for a really successful semester. I really appreciate it. That's it, thank you. Any other comments from Watch Hill Conservancy or uh, anyone else before we wrap? Just a, a quick uh, thank you. Um, on behalf of the stakeholders, you guys did a marvelous job. Um, one thing that has really changed in my thinking now, uh, based on your guys' beautiful renderings, is the importance of maintaining that harbor view, but from your new elevated pedestrian public areas. So nothing is being lost, and in fact, it's maybe even being dramatized. And um, I'm, I'm loving the, the public space that you can see from, from uh, Bay Street. It's, it's going to be the new vista from some of the shops. And uh, I, think, I think the community will um, enjoy getting their arms around that whole concept. And it just opens up. Um, so many engineering solutions to deal with storms and sea level rise. So um, great thinking and thank you. Thank you. Um, I will be in your class on Tuesday to talk to you about how we're going to sort of wrap this up. I do have a student who will be working with me to compile all the stuff from all the classes into a deliverable to the Watch Hill Conservancy. So we'll talk to you more on Tuesday about that. And also, um, you know, at some point we can also have a conversation about, you know, I've been mentioning portfolios a lot. I know Richard, I'm sure you've, you've talked to the students about this, but in this very, very, very weird time, where are the opportunities for you guys to network, to job search, to talk to professionals in the field, to think about your next steps? We can have a conversation about that on Tuesday as well, if you like. I mean, part of Sea Grant's investment in this um, capstone is workforce development. And we really want to see you guys move forward and do great things. So. Um, I think the more that we can have open conversations about that and figure out how to connect you guys with different professionals, um, we can talk about that on, on Tuesday. So I Thank you. That's, that's, that's a great offer, Teresa. I really appreciate it because, uh, yeah, things are going to be uh, totally different here when, when we open up. Uh, we're also going to do a run through on what we're going to do uh, for uh, our Wednesday presentation. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, hopefully, that's coming along too, or that will be coming along uh, okay. by um, by Tuesday. So great! I see Deborah is unmuted. 
Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that, Teresa. I wanted to just comment to all of the uh, students that your presentations were spectacular and, um, and your ideas are really interesting. In my professional experience, uh, you've got to give these presentations again and again and again. They get fine-tuned every time. And so uh, as you're building out your portfolios, um, really consider those presentations that go along with those because um, they will be polished and, uh, and morph as you give them to different audiences and get other people's feedback. So I would just encourage you to just explore that way because, uh, because it, it'll help a lot when you actually do your interviews. Great, thank you, Deborah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, very good. Well, we'll hopefully see everybody on next Wednesday um, who have you know joined us for this class presentation today. And with that, um, I'm willing to wrap this up, Richard. Unless you have anything else you want to add. I don't have anything else to say. I just want to say thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Great job today, and thank you to our stakeholders. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. All right, thank have you. a good one. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Sheridan. Yeah. Do you have a minute? Yeah. Uh, uh, get in touch with me. Uh, email me your phone number, Kevin, and I'll get in touch.